So having said that, it gives me incredible pleasure to uh, introduce our next speaker. Dr. White is going to talk on dense bone diseases, too much of a bad or good thing. Really, Dr. White needs no introduction, uh, but, but as you know, he is really our, our most experienced uh, discussant of rare bone diseases. And he is now Professor Emeritus um, at, at the uh, Washington University School of Medicine, um, but, uh, and, and working hard on documenting so many things that he's cared for over his career. And so Dr. White, we welcome you back. Great to have you. Yes, uh, thank you, Laura. And uh, good uh, morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening to the folks who have tuned in for this. And my lecture is, yes, dense bone diseases, too much of a bad or good thing. And what am I um, hinting at when I say thing? It's bone quality. So you could have dense bone disorders, as I'll show you, with too much of bad quality bone, or you could have dense bone diseases with too much of good quality bone. And uh, I'll begin uh, in this way. So Michael, I need the next uh, slide. Yes. We're working on that. Dr. White, I and I forgot one thing for our audience. So this lecture will be a bit longer than usual. Uh, um, so we will take some mini breaks uh, if things come up in the chat. Um, uh, we are expecting Dr. White to speak for an hour or a bit more. And then we have two great cases. Uh, so be sure to stick with us. Uh, it should be a great afternoon. Sorry. Yeah, uh, Dr. Right. White, I just gave you uh, remote control. Okay, so here we go. Nothing moving yet. Um, are you, did the uh, pop-up window come up on the screen? Uh, what came up is that thing we were talking about at the top. Should I click on that? Uh, about the OIF screen. Uh, yes. Okay, I've done that. Then there's view options, nothing happening. So back to you, Michael. Yeah, I apologize. If you click on your screen, does that not uh, engage it? Ah, here we go. Okay, okay my disclosures consult for our event sciences in New York, uh, but really nothing uh, uh, relevant to uh, this lecture. And uh, yes, bone, dense bone diseases, I'll be talking about them using two uh, as illustrations uh, uh, each. Bad quality, I'll review the osteopetroses and uh, as a Mendelian disorder and then turn to skeletal fluorosis as a, an acquired disorder with dense bones and poor quality bone. But then I'll turn to good quality bone diseases and talk about the so-called endosteal hyperostoses that include sclerosteosis, Van Buchem disease, and so-called worth type endosteal hyperostosis, which turns out to be uh, LRP5 and LRP6 high bone mass. Uh, autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant disorders there. And then for an acquired disorder, I'll briefly describe hepatitis C-associated osteosclerosis, uh, a disorder uh, where bones are dense and the quality seems to be good. Um, dense bone diseases. Uh, let me try to convince you that cumulatively, the population with dense bone diseases is not few. I'll show you how many there are. So if you're a fellow, a trainee uh, uh, in maybe endocrinology or rheumatology, uh, I assure you, you're going to encounter such patients. And the way this might happen if you're first going into the endocrine or rheumatology clinic might be a situation like this where a 52-year-old woman has uh, fractured her uh, wrist, it was casted, it healed up okay. And then being perimenopausal, she went for bone density. And this is what the uh, report might look like. And you look at it and then you see the normal range. Uh, 
but you don't see any crosshair in it for her. And if you look down here, you're worried that this might be the worst case of osteoporosis you've ever seen because there's no mark telling you what her bone mineral density is. Instead, uh, you need to be alert, and I'll tell you why, to a situation like that, where there's a dot at the top of uh, the uh, illustration. Uh, what does that mean? It looks like her bone density is well above the normal range. And yet, uh, to this day, the DEXA report, if you only looked at a small segment of the report, might say for this woman, there's no increased risk of fracture. And why is that? It's something that I've been trying to straighten out now for about 20 years without any success. Um, and that is, understandably, the World Health Organization uh, used DEXA uh, and uh, bone mass, uh, bone density measurements, worried about identifying and treating osteoporosis. So the WHO uh, developed criteria for diagnosing bone status, defining a T-score, which you might know is uh, the bone uh, mineral density um, of young adult uh, men and women, sort of the optimal bone density you would think of a, maybe a 25 or 30 year old. That's the T-score. And then for a worry about osteoporosis, how far have you deviated with age away from the T-score? And the densitometrist actually usurped some of the language that uh, preceded densitometry. For instance, osteopenia, we always used to say, oh, you put up an X-ray, there's not much uh, mineral in that skeleton. It's pretty osteopenic. Um, and then, Osteoporosis was, in a sense, usurped, uh, knowing that bone mineral density does what it does, but it really doesn't diagnose osteoporosis. And then they assigned um, descriptions to uh, how these terms should be referred. And minus 2.5 T-score or lower and fracture was then designated to be severe osteoporosis, minus 2.5 or lower osteoporosis. And then they chose the word osteopenia. They adapted it to minus one T-score to minus 2.5. And then uh, for uh, minus one or higher, the reports would come out as normal. So in your situation here, you're in clinic, and if you look just at the report, it might read no increased risk of fracture, normal bone density, but you should look more deeply into the report. And for this particular woman, her bone density uh, was 358% of uh, what would be normal at her age. You see her Z-score is plus 22 in L1. And then at the bottom, she's got three times the bone mineral density uh, appropriate for age or expected for age with a Z-score and a T-score of plus 19. So this is hardly a situation where fracture risk uh, uh, can be pronounced as uh, nil. So disorders that cause dense bones, uh, you've got that kind of report. Uh, you've clearly got dense bones in the lumbar spine and I could tell you the hip uh, matches. And then you have to look at uh, a table like this that tells you how many dense bone disorders there are as you begin to uh, find out what's uh, going on with this woman. And here, uh, are the skeletal dysplasias. 30 years ago, we're very much the territory of the uh, clinical geneticist, the, mis the dysmorphometrist, and the radiologist. And you see uh, a number of uh, disorders. Among them are, is osteopetrosis, or since the 1960s, as I'll tell you, uh, what were referred to as endosteal hyperostoses. Uh, among them, Van Buchem disease and sclerosteosis are uh, forms of endosteal hyperostosis. 
And then uh, you had the metabolic disorders, uh, maybe uh, more uh, in keeping with what the endocrinologist was going to see. Uh, for a while, we thought Paget's disease was the most uh, second most common so-called metabolic bone disease, but renal osteodystrophy in the United States is probably more common than Paget's. You had that in the metabolic category. You had skeletal fluorosis in the metabolic category. And then you had other disorders. And many of these were the territory of the hemonc folks, lymphoma, mastocytosis, multiple myeloma, myelofibrosis, um, indolent myelomas were thought to sometimes cause dense bones. Um, if not that, um, uh, let me back up, sorry. Uh, these other conditions that are very much the territory of the hem uh, hematologists and oncologists. But now go back to the skeletal dysplasias, uh, the left-hand column, and recognize that over about the last uh, 20 years, uh, essentially all of these are understood now at the uh, gene level, they're Mendelian disorders. Uh, and with that, uh, you have uh, clues to pathogenesis. So what I'm saying to you, if you're an endocrinologist or a rheumatologist is these skeletal dysplasias are now understood at the gene level and uh, hints about pathogenesis. So endocrinologists, rheumatologists, they're heading your way. Uh, the patients will be diagnosed, let's say by geneticists, but then how are you gonna treat these disorders? So uh, dense bone disorders are uh, increasingly entering uh, the world of endocrinology and rheumatology. To understand them, you need to, uh, I think, appreciate uh, skeletal formation being um, uh, or consisting of three uh, major uh, features. Uh, during uh, the uh, pediatric years, of course, there's growth of the skeleton, but if uh, things are going to go along normally, the skeleton has to model or shape properly and be you a child or be you an adult, uh, there's bone remodeling ongoing, also bone uh, called bone turnover, osteoblast forming bone, osteoclast resorbing it. So this is uh, what's involved in skeletal formation uh, uh, over time. And growth and modeling uh, of especially appendicular bones occurs like this. Here's the little child's bone outlined like this, and there's a physis, a growth plate, and in it resting, proliferating, hypertrophying, and then calcifying chondrocytes drive the bone to uh, grow. Uh, and here's the bigger kid's bone. It's outlined like this. For the bone to model properly, to shape properly, two things have to happen. The osteoclasts have to expand the medullary canal and this blue stuff that's deposited here has to be removed, not by the node of Ron VA, but a ring of Ron VA, so-called on Koch, where osteoclasts, their job is to remove this to properly form the concave uh, surface of this distal femur. So things could go wrong with this, uh, causing dense bone diseases. Again, here is a bit of anatomy you have the physis, that's the growth plate. The epiphysis is above it. Below it is the metaphysis or metaphysis. And then you have the diaphysis or diaphysis, a properly shaped bone, cortical and trabecular bone. So modeling abnormalities over here uh, can cause radiographically dense bones. You could have a modeling abnormality where the bone becomes widened. It doesn't shape properly. The blue stuff isn't removed. Or it could be a narrow bone where there's over tubulation, too much of a tube. And if the cortices are of normal diameter, it being a thin bone, it'll still look radiographically dense. So you've got modeling abnormalities like this or this that can cause dense bones. And then some definition. Uh, if there is trabecular bone thickening, we refer to it as osteosclerosis. Uh, 
And if it's cortical bone th thickening, it could be on the periosteal surface. And it, we call it hyperostosis there. If it's on the medullary canal moving inward, it's endosteal hyperostosis. So you really have two terms, hyperostosis and osteosclerosis that are helpful in thinking about what the differential diagnosis might be. So osteosclerosis, trabecular bone thickening, hyperostosis, cortical bone thickening. And for many years, it was the radiologist who would give us clues. This book, maybe 15, 20 years old, gametes in uh, bone and spine radiology uh, provided lists based on hyperostosis and osteosclerosis that looked like this. Uh, we knew that from the radiologist, you could have cortical and trabecular bone um, thickening uh, both and osteopetrosis or pycnodysostosis would be examples of disorders that combine the two. You could have cortical bone thickening predominantly, no or little osteosclerosis, and that could be Van Buchem's disease, sclerosteosis, endosteal hyperostosis, cortical bone, progressive diaphyseal dysplasia. And then there could be disorders of osteosclerosis, trabecular bone thickening, some dysplastic, but many hematologic or uh, metabolic or even neoplastic, where it's especially trabecular bone that becomes thickened and not cortical bone. So the radiologists were helping us by describing whether or not there was a combination of uh, the two or one predominantly. So now I'll turn to the dense bone disorders, two of them, like I said, as examples of bad bone quality uh, associated with dense bone disease. And we'll start with osteopetrosis, petrified bone, a term that probably uh, originated in the 1920s or 30s, or marble bone disease, um, not quite accurate because you all know that this bone is structurally unsound and can fracture. But the story of the osteopetrosis begins here. This is Heinrich Albert Schoenberg. He was a surgeon in Hamburg, um, Germany uh, at the turn of the last century. And he bought a machine to do ranconography, do ranconograms, do x-rays, and actually became, I think, quite justifiably considered the world's first radiologist. Uh, he started to, to use that technique. And then uh, in 1904, in this one paragraph at the local medical meeting in Hamburg, uh, Germany, described uh, what uh, Clemens Bergwitz uh, translated for me uh, as a summary about how Mr. Albert Schoenberg demonstrated ranconograms of a rare bone disorder, not reported thus far, a 26 year old man steps into a pothole, x-rayed, no trabecular structure was visible. The bone was completely radiopaque. No, a marrow cavity was missing and the cortices were widened. He x-rays, if I could use that term, the whole patient, and he finds that this man also had other fractures, which he didn't know about. The trabecular structure, again, uh, was really absent in all parts of his skeleton. He noticed per, uh, perpendicular rings that I'll show you an example of in this young man. And the conclusion was Albert Schoenberg um, uh, demonstrated findings consistent with an extraordinary mineralization of the skeleton as an aside, uh, Albert Schoenberg did a little bit more. He also used the machine to look at a 3,000 year old Egyptian mummy uh, recently acquired by the museum. But his name will live uh, forever for that description of what comes to be osteopetrosis. And in 1904, he came to St. Louis, the Louisiana Purchase Exposition. He won the science prize at that time being the world's first uh, radiologist. So there's a history that ties up with us here in Missouri. But what's the pathogenesis? Not the etiology, but the pathogenesis. We know from the radiographic studies, the gross anatomists, that there must be in osteopetrosis, a global failure of osteoclast mediated skeletal resorption. That 
That's how you can get that type of X-ray change. And therefore, the failure of osteoclasts to resorb the skeleton might be because they don't work. They're there, but they don't work or they don't form in the first place. And this difference has become very important for the diagnosis and considering the treatment for osteopetroses, as I'll mention. So yes, uh, in osteopetrosis, this fails to be resorbed. Uh, it never uh, becomes a concave surface and this uh, medullary canal doesn't form. And it looks like this to the gross anatomist and also to the radiologist. This must be osteoclast failure. And this is surely what Albert Schoenberg saw with his Rankinogram. This is a, a man that worked at Barnes Jewish Hospital. You see the horizontal lines that he talked about, the lack of a concave surface, the lack of a medullary canal. This is the Erlenmeyer flask deformity of classic uh, so-called adult osteopetrosis. But the, if I could use the expression smoking gun for uh, knowing that the osteoclast had failed to work is shown here. You've got the growth plate here blown up and you have the resting chondrocytes then they proliferate, then they hypertrophy, blood vessels come here. And if all goes well, normally the calcified cartilage should be removed by functional osteoclasts and then the osteoblasts will start making bone. What happens in osteopetrosis of any type is that bars or islands of calcified primary spongiosa are embedded in well mineralized bone laid down by the osteoblasts, but the osteoclasts have failed to remove that calcified cartilage. It just became encased. So this means that the osteoclasts are not working. They never remove the uh, cartilage. And that's how we come to the pathogenesis of osteopetrosis involving an act, uh, a failure of osteoclast action. This results in the bad, bad bone. It cracks, and we talk about chalk stick fractures, uh, cracking like uh, snapping a piece of uh, chalk. And why is that? The brittleness is because you have defective modeling. It's probably not a good idea to have an Erlenmeyer flask deformity, but in that bone in the metaphysis is calcified cartilage bars. They don't belong there. With osteoclast failure, the osteoblasts poke along, but there's not a turnover of the hydroxyapatite crystals and they harden over time. And maybe more importantly, this failure of osteons to interconnect, you should weave your collagen back and forth in the bone to have a strong bone and that doesn't occur. So that causes brittleness. And then finally, there could be microfracture uh, repair abnormalities. You step off a curb, you crack your bone a little bit, but uh, it doesn't repair. The osteoclasts aren't working. So all this seems to account for the brittleness of osteopetrotic bone. And here is kind of a historical description of how osteopetrosis has been considered over the years. Malignant infantile untreated death within the first decade of life, or one that's described as benign or adult, uh, based on types of inheritance and prognosis. The prevalence for the malignant type is one and a half million in the USA, a bit higher in Europe, and the benign one in 100,000 in uh, the US to 500,000. And interestingly, uh, it seems that there's more of the benign adult osteopetrosis in Europe. So where is malignant common? It's common in Costa Rica, Middle East, the Chuvash Republic of uh, Russia, uh, where there's a founder mutation in SNX10, as, in, in, as there is in Vosterbad in Sweden, a province, I think, uh, above uh, Stockholm. Uh, so there are cluster and founder mutations uh, in some regions of the world. And I'll tell you what they uh, are, the mutations. Malignant looks like this. The radiographs look like that, no medullary space, poor modeling. Uh, 
And the complications are of two types, no medullary space. So you get a leukoerythroblastic anemia, compromises formation of uh, white cells, red cells, and platelets causing big trouble, extramedullary hematopoiesis. And then the cranial foramina don't widen. The osteoclast should be making the uh, foramina wider to accommodate the growing op, um, cranial nerves so that you get cranial nerve palsies and malignant osteopetrosis, those two. And then the signs and symptoms are understandable. Uh, the cloinal uh, stenosis, you're not forming uh, sinuses. Uh, it seems as though the, the uh, child at two or three years always has a stuffy nose, but that's bone, uh, that's not mucus. Uh, short stature, nystagmus, uh, uh, knock knee deformity. And then from the uh, hematologic standpoint, recurrent infections, uh, hemorrhage, bruising. These are the type of uh, factors that lead to death within the first decade of life. Generally, uh, the prognosis for the malignant infantile form. Then for so-called benign osteopetrosis, hardly always benign. This is, uh, as I'll show you, I think uh, what we can call nowadays Albert Schoenberg disease. I'll tell you a bit more about that. But chalk stick, chalk stick fractures, loss of hearing, vision, facial nerve palsy, uh, trouble getting blood supply to the teeth with osteomyelitis of the mandible. And then interestingly, an important low back pain, the brittleness of this bone often cracks the posterior elements of let's say lumbar vertebrae. And there can be spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis slippage. And for some reason, scoliosis. But then over the years, and now we're talking probably the 1960s, intermediate osteopetrosis was talked about. Well, it's not malignant, but it's not benign. Here's a man I saw in the 1980s who was transfusion dependent. That's what his x-rays look like. And what came about was a nosology for osteopetrosis that didn't at that time have the etiology, the gene-based explanation uh, or really much about the pathogenesis other than failure of osteoclast to work. So you had malignant intermediate, uh, one was described with renal tubular acidosis. Some seem to have neurological storage disease. Um, and then in the 1980s, uh, it was uh, thought that the adult type might be uh, autosomal dominant, but of two forms, type one and type two. And I'll show you where things went off the tracks a little bit um, when it was uh, thought that there are these two types of autosomal dominant osteopetrosis based on the radiological, biochemical, and uh, shared autosomal dominant uh, uh, method of uh, inheritance. So there was confusion then and Albert Schoenberg disease was designated type two. And to this day, uh, you can um, find an adult, look at the skull, not quite as dense as its base, and then a rugged Jersey spine as characteristic of Albert Schoenberg disease, ADO type two, whereas what was designated ADO one had a diffusely thick skull, no rugged jersey, but diffusely um, osteosclerotic vertebrae. It turned out that <clears throat> there really is only one true autosomal dominant osteopetrosis in humans. And that's what then became called type two, Albert Schoenberg disease. And as I'll show you, type one isn't an osteopetrosis, but it's LRP5 activation. Uh, very much the opposite of failure of osteoclast to function, but instead osteoblasts that in a sense are overactive. So osteopetrosis now has uh, a great understanding uh, during the last 20 years of etiology, meaning the underlying gene defect. And with it comes the molecular pathogenesis, partly or uh, well understood. 
And it turns out that the first osteopetrosis to be understood um, at the gene level was actually these three sisters from across the Mississippi River from me and their healthy sister. Uh, this one born first had an X-ray that looked like malignant osteopetrosis. The parents were actually told that she was going to die. Obviously she didn't, she had affected uh, sisters. And when I came to St. Louis and here we are in the 1980s, we described them as having osteopetrosis, but also renal tubular acidosis, a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis and basal ganglia calcification. And then Bill Sly, uh, chief of genetics at Children's went into Goodman and Gilman, the textbook of pharmacology and said, how can you have osteoclast failure and renal tubular acidosis? And said, I wonder if carbonic anhydrase is abnormal here. And we sent blood erythrocytes to Richard Taschen. And to make a long story short, he found a complete absence of carbonic anhydrase too in the sisters, half normal levels in the parents. The healthy sister had normal amounts of carbonic anhydrase too. So this was the first osteopetrosis understood. And of course the gene was found to be eventually found to be uh, defective. So this was the first osteopetrosis understood um, at uh, the gene and uh, pathogenic level. So it showed how carbonic anhydrase was important for doing what? For making protons and bicarbonate so that the proton uh, H plus could enter outside the um, osteoclast into this sealing zone to do what? To form hydrochloric acid, which then would dissolve the mineral. So now you've got a need for carbonic anhydrase. You need a proton pump and its subcomponents to be functioning. And you also need a mechanism for chloride to enter this space, a chloride channel um, to let chloride in, a bicarbonate out to form hydrochloric acid. So it turns out that as the genes underlying uh, human osteopetroses were identified, many of them are associated with defective acidification by osteoclasts. So you start here, then you went to chloride channel seven deficiency, sending bl uh, blood to Wim van Hole in Europe. Uh, this turned out to be when heterozygous defect, single defective allele, the explanation for Alba Schoenberg disease. But then along came a defect in the proton pump, uh, things associated with the proton pump as the molecular basis for recessive osteopetrosis. So chloride channel seven mutation, if it had a dominant negative, it's heterozygous and Alba Schoenberg disease, you would get the skeletal disease. If you had haploinsufficiency, let's say one of the alleles was missing, all you would get was a carrier, no bone disease. So this is the range of the phenotype genotype association with chloride channel seven mutation. TCIRG1, uh, part of the proton pump was mutated autosomal recessive and became the major explanation for autosomal recessive osteopetrosis where the uh, proton pump is not only in the osteoclast but in the stomach controlling gastric acidification. So when it's abnormal, the osteoclasts don't work, you don't acidify your stomach and you don't absorb calcium. So in Philadelphia, osteopetral rickets uh, was a paradox of dense bones from osteopetrosis together with rickets at the growth plate. And now we know for the recessive forms of osteopetrosis, TCIRG1, osteopetro rickets, and chloride channel seven recessive, two, two defective alleles explain most cases the recessive disease. At the uh, maybe 40 years ago, pycnodysostosis was uh, a dense bone disorder. It wasn't considered at that time to be an osteopetrosis. Uh, the uh, person who seemed likely to have it was Henri Le Toulouse-Lautrec, Bella Pock in France, an impressionist painter. 
said to wear a hat because he had an open fontanelle, beard, small jaw, stubby fingers, uh, fracturing, needs a cane. And it, it turned out that osteopicnodysostosis uh, in 1995 was actually the first form of osteopetrosis to be understood at the gene level involving Thepsin K deficiency. Here's what the bones of uh, pycnodysostosis look like. I think we might be lucky to hear in the uh, case presentations about some patients. And here, cathepsin K, yeah, the hydrogen ion, the hydrochloric acid dissolves the mineral, but then the cathepsin K has to clean up the proteinaceous material in the osteoclast so you can understand if this goes wrong, how you can get an osteoclastic <laughs> phenotype. And now we have this, the uh, classification going back to 2013, Sabachi and colleagues talking about these genes underlying human autosomal recessive osteopetrosis with some phenotypic uh, characterization, growth retardation. Could there be hypocalcemia? What's the life expectancy? So I'm telling you that now we're moving away from malignant and benign osteopetrosis to a gene-based uh, description of not only the uh, autosomal recessive forms, but also the autosomal dominant forms. And this is very important. What was revealed by characterizing the molecular defects is that there are osteoclast rich osteopetroses where Okay, they're there, but they're not functioning. So you could do bone marrow transplantation, get the osteoclast from the donor to grow out and take care of the osteopetrosis. You'll now resorb the skeleton. But rarely on a bone biopsy, you'll see no osteoclasts, uh, osteoclast poor osteopetroses, and this can't be fixed by bone marrow transplantation. So it's very important nowadays to get a molecular diagnosis, or at least to look at the bone to know which you're dealing with to know whether or not this might be a therapeutic option. So the osteoclast, rich osteopetroses, all these are genes that have been identified associated with uh, underlying uh, the dense bone disease, poor quality. And what uh, Dr. Anna Teddy and I have been asked to do for bone is organize a special issue in bone. Now, we're looking at the osteopetroses according to the uh, associated gene and talking more about, well, what is the range of the phenotype, the severity? And that seems to be under underway. The osteoclast poor osteopetroses, well, they are involved with the rank ligand rank uh, system that you know well, rank ligand binds the rank to uh, uh, and activate NF-kappa B, and an absence of this or that will lead to an osteoclast poor form of osteopetrosis. So those are the genetic uh, forms. Uh, uh, Laura, are there any questions? I'll stop briefly here. Any burning questions? Uh, not in the chat yet. Okay, um, uh, we'll welcome them. Right. And then I'll turn to what is now possible, uh, where previously only Mother Nature could cause osteopetrosis. Now, anti-resorptive treatment has become so powerful uh, that you can cause pharmacologic osteopetrosis if excessive dosing is given uh, to children during growth. You can now recapitulate pharmacologically osteo. Uh, petrosis by blocking bone resorption. And when it comes to bisphosphonate toxicity, uh, you all know about osteonecrosis of the jaw and atypical femoral fractures as being worries. But actually the first uh, worry was based on this boy who came to us having received permidronate infusions because he had a slightly elevated alkphos and complained about bone pain. And it was thought, oh, maybe it's like OI uh, respond to permidronate with less bone pain. But when we looked at all of his chemistries and radiology, pre-permidronate infusions, he had a normal skeleton. But after about two and a half years of uh, sort of relentless increasing doses of permidronate, 
did this. He developed a club or Erlenmeyer flask deformity, dense bones, reminiscent of an osteopetrosis phenotype. So in 2003, we reported bisphosphonate-induced osteopetrosis in the New England Journal of Medicine. And then he came back five years later for follow-up. He's now off of bisphosphonate, but we study him and report him in the JBMR as this. He leaves us uh, looking like this and then grows. Uh, and uh, now a young man at 15 or 16, growth plates uh, fused, he still has the persisting deformity. The dense bone has become somewhat osteopenic. Maybe it's because the bone is widened. So he's uh, been given permanent Erlenmeyer flask deformities and an osteopenia there, uh, where again, we didn't see that he had any other underlying genetic, et cetera, cause of a dense bone disorder. And then quite extraordinarily in a trip to uh, India, and this will be a chapter, uh, I think in the special issue, are some children that were shown to me said by, uh, said to have a diagnosis of osteogenesis imperfecta, but then given very high doses of zolendronate. And this is the subsequent skeleton of one of those children said to have OI that looks like this. Dr. Sanjay Bodada has uh, kindly uh, given me these uh, films and we'll put that into a chapter about pharmacologic osteopetrosis. But this is OI treated with big doses of cylindronate. So yes, now we can actually have, if we overdo it with anti-resorptives, uh, pharmacologic osteopetrosis. I'll now turn to fluoride. Skeletal fluorosis, different from dental fluorosis. And this may be the most common metabolic bone disease on the planet. And the reason I say that is it's endemic in India, China, parts of Africa. In the United States, what we see, and I'll show you this is non-endemic skeletal fluorosis being part of the acquired bad bone quality. So here's severe bone deformities in children. They might have some vitamin D deficiency, but they have skeletal fluorosis in India. And in India, it's been said that there are truly tens of millions of people with skeletal fluorosis. Why? Because their drinking water, well water, is contaminated with fluoride. fluoride. Um, endemic skeletal fluorosis. Here's a picture of the kids in one village and they have skeletal fluorosis. In the West, um, we reported this in the Lancet, skeletal fluorosis in a refugee coming out of uh, Kenya in this refugee camp. That's an interesting story where uh, if you look, the refugee camp is there. There's South Sudan, uh, Ethiopia, Somalia. The refugees would come to here. They'd be along a river. If you blew up this part of the refugee uh, section, the camp, you see here that they got their drinking water, 50,000 people from borehole number five. And a man from Somalia went to the uh, refugee camp, ended up going to Canada, arrived uh, complaining of uh, achy dense bones, had a bone biopsy but had normal levels of fluoride in blood and urine. Why? Because he was now drinking Canadian water. And it was the bone biopsy that was eventually analyzed that showed tons of fluoride in it. He had skeletal fluorosis from um, uh, too much uh, fluoride in his uh, well water. In St. Louis, we identified uh, tea as a potential source of skeletal fluorosis, the world's most popular beverage, more so than coffee still. Lady comes to clinic, uh, you're familiar with the spot. Her bone density is plus nine. Uh, her skeleton years uh, ago was okay, but then she develops kind of a rugged jersey, osteosclerotic pattern, bone biopsy is more like an osteomalacia. And I learned that she's drinking two gallons a day of double strength instant tea. And we saw that a few months later in another lady. So Camellia sinensis, the uh, black tea uh, uh, plant uh, attracts fluoride for some reason and depending on where it's grown, is it on a volcanic uh, 
rock hillside may uh, increase the amount uh, or contain a substantial amount of fluoride. And if you overdo it with instant tea, um, and even bottled teas went to the uh, grocery store in St. Louis, got uh, uh, bottled teas, and uh, four is the upper limit of normal for a beverage allowed by the EPA in the United States. And you could see this one, four <laughs> milligrams per deciliter, four parts per million. And if you're drinking uh, two liters of this a day, you'll uh, be approaching uh, what may over the course of 10 years uh, prove to be a uh, high level of uh, fluoride. Uh, in the uh, United States, skeletal fluorosis due to inhalation abuse of difluoroethane containing computer cleaners, huffing, uh, can cause a periostitis deformance that looks like that. It could uh, look like this radiographically, be terribly painful and lead to fracturing. In the pharmacologic world, you have voriconazole as an antifungal that contains lots of fluoride in it. And if you receive this as a treatment, uh, going beyond a, a brief course for an infection, but if it's used for prophylaxis, this contains in a daily dose 65 milligrams of fluoride, which is well above four milligrams per day and skeletal fluorosis can result. Uh, recovery from skeletal fluorosis, an interesting case report where we biopsied a man uh, at baseline with the disease and then 10 years later studied the amount of fluoride, an accountant who was swallowing toothpaste uh, with fluoride in it developed skeletal fluorosis. So that's the bad. Uh, Mendelian and uh, acquired forms of dense bone disease where the quality is poor, but there's also high quality dense bone disease. And I'll tell you about the endosteal hyperostoses and their worth type now called high bone mass, sclerosteosis and buch van buchum disease. And the disorders here, all three of them are disorders of LRP5 and now we know six wind signaling. Uh, you know that on the surface of osteoblasts, you have frizzled uh, 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 protein receptor. Uh, WINTS will bind to that. LRP5 and 6 combine as a way of increasing beta catenin signaling and osteoblastiform bone. So what goes wrong in sclerosteosis? What is it? It's an autosomal recessive disorder where there's loss of function mutations not there, but in the SOS gene that encodes what? sclerostin as an inhibitor of bone formation. And the only patient I've ever seen with this uh, showed me his picture when he was a little one, different from uh, his normal brother. He has a big skull. He becomes an engineering student, comes to clinic with a facial palsy, that broad forehead, and cracking headaches with uh, what was thought to be rhinorrhea. It wasn't mucus, it was cerebral spinal fluid that was leaking from his nose. And if you x-rayed his hands, there was cutaneous skin, not bony syndactyly here. These fingers were fused, which is a characteristic feature of sclerosteosis. His skull looked like that. And the symptomatology that comes with this autosomal recessive absence of sclerostin includes hearing loss, vertigo, headaches, facial paralysis, et cetera, et cetera, and tends to be lethal by uh, age 30. The stuff he knows is, like I said, uh, cerebral spinal uh, rhinorrhea. Uh, you can appreciate with all of uh, this how uh, ultimately there can be uh, uh, a Chiari malformation, raised intracranial pressure, uh, leading to a need for craniectomy. And on craniectomy, for that fellow, eight drill bits were burned out, getting uh, enough uh, access to his skull to remove on von Kassestein this highly trabecular dense skull bone that on uh, von Kassesteining uh, 
uh, or uh, on uh, Masson staining uh, would show you very active osteoblast, putting down osteoid, but uh, otherwise good quality bone. So too much of a good thing, sclerosteosis being a defect in SOST. Then you have the sister disease, von Buchem disease, which is due to what? Deactivation of a downstream enhancer. So there's a mutation in an enhancer of the SOS gene. So you're missing an enhancer. You don't make sclerostin. And it's similar to sclerosteosis. Looks like this, dense skull, broad jaw. No syndactyly, uh, less severe, but still quite severe. Uh, with normal bone being formed in Van Buchem disease. And then uh, we have sclerosteosis now being talked about as in two flavors, one and two. And we saw this where it was previously thought that two was purely European in folks uh, in Southern uh, India in the Tamil uh, Nadu province where yes, you had traditional sclerosteosis do, and this is Steve Mum's molecular biologist mutation studies with DNA sent to us, uh, where you had regular sclerosteosis type one, but then uh, surviving into middle age with uh, very dense bone disease. And Steve found for the first time a fourth LRP4 mutation. This is outside of Europe for the first time. And this is underlying sclerosteosis type two. But LRP4 is part of uh, the whole wind signaling pathway. So uh, LRP4 and LRP5, as I'll show you, are involved in high bone mass. All these LRP5, uh, LRPs are involved in sclerotic high bone mass disorder. And the story for LRP5 is very interesting. Uh, in an Omaha kindred where a lady was in a car crash, developed a backache, had a very dense looking bone radiographically, but no fracture, uh, the group there mapped in her family, dense, high quality bone, no history of fracturing. And they said that there was non-syndromic high bone mass. That's where the high bone mass expression uh, comes from. And what they found was in the first beta propeller of LRP5, again, this would bind to frizzle-related uh, protein receptor and WINS would come along and turn on uh, beta catenin signaling. What was present in this family was a mutation, this one in the first beta propeller. And the pathogenesis here was that sclerostin, which should be binding to LRP5, right here, couldn't. So uh, it couldn't, the sclerostin couldn't act as an inhibitor and this went right to the frizzled uh, Wnt receptor and activated bone formation. So that uh, Omaha kindred was published, then a Connecticut kindred was published, and you may have seen this in the New England Journal of Medicine back then, high bone mass, which was said to be syndromic with a broad jaw and torus palatinus uh, but no fracturing diffusely osteosclerotic and hyperostatic skeleton. And then this woman came to me with a, his, a diagnosis of osteopetrosis, trigeminal uh, neuralgia, facial palsy, some deafness, achy everywhere, uh, very thickened skull, and a Chiari malformation. Uh, the, the cerebellum is coming down below this line. And she also complained about exostoses uh, encasing her posterior teeth, looking like this on a CAT scan. The teeth were embedded in bone. And I knew that this was uh, not osteopetrosis. And uh, Steve Mum looks at LRP5, and she has the identical mutation to the Omaha and the Connecticut family, but clearly has skeletal disease needing craniectomy. So here we start to define high bone mass as not syndromic or non-syndromic, but a disease. And that's the way it's uh, proven to be high bone mass disease. And again, LRP5 should be pulled away from the signaling complex. Uh, 
by sclerostin or DKK1. And if you have a mutation in right there in the first beta propeller and it sticks uh, here, you'll have increased bone formation. Um, it turns out, and I'll show you this uh, with a few remaining minutes, that LRP6, a cognate co-receptor, is acting in the signaling complex just like LRP5. And if its first beta propeller is mutated, it doesn't bind SOST or DKK1. And if it then hooks up with the signaling complex, beta catenin signaling is increased and the osteoblast makes too much good quality bone. LRP6 high bone mass, cognate co-receptors. Uh, it was always a candidate for a high bone mass disease. And two families came to us, oh, maybe five, six years ago and didn't have an LRP5 mutation like this mother and daughter with the broad jaw. But instead, the first family had Taurus palatinus acquired a broad jaw, but instead of an LRP5 mutation, they had an LRP6 mutation with dense bones that couldn't be distinguished from LRP5 high bone mass. Interestingly, they're tall. Here's the height Z scores, plus two, minus two, and if you look at Albert Schoenberg disease, chloride channel seven, their height is average. But these folks with LRP6 high bone mass in red or five, they tend to be tall. So they've got a high bone mass disorder and their height is hardly compromised. It actually seems to be a bit excessive. So what have these uh, disorders uh, taught us? This beautiful diagram by Wim Van uh, Hall and his colleagues show you the range where if you have loss of function mutations in LRP5, uh, you know that you can get osteoporosis, pseudoglioma syndrome. Carriers of the recessive mutation can have low bone density or idiopathic osteoporosis. The healthy state is here normal polymorphisms in LRP5. But then as you go in this direction, high bone mass phenotype. Here, gain of function mutations in LRP5 causing high bone mass syndromic or non-syndromic or sometimes uh, skeletal disease are here. Carriers of vambucums or sclerosteosis with only one single abnormal SOS gene are here. And then you get out to terrible disease with venbuchymus sclerosteosis if you've got two mutated um, uh, alleles. So this became important information for bone pharmaceuticals. You had the anti-resorptives. You had denosumab as an anti-rank ligand. Anticathepsin was being tested, odanocatib. But anabolics at the time have been teriparatide and a balo paratide, Timlos, uh, strontium used in, in Europe. But then, uh, from what you learn from these very rare disorders, is if you went after sclerostin with a monoclonal antibody, and that turned out to be romazosumab, then you can take advantage of what these rare disorders have taught us about a now. Uh, recapitulating with what Mo Mother Nature gave us as high bone mass uh, phenotypes of good quality uh, for treatment of osteoporosis. Hepatitis C associated osteosclerosis, interesting, acquired, dense, but painful, high quality bone, um, turned out to be a, uh, a, uh, a disorder that uh, involved a hepatitis C causing an increase in the liver of production of IGF uh, uh, 2E um, combined with IGF binding protein 2. For some reason in these very rare patients with hepatitis C infection, they would elaborate both the binding protein and the 2E precursor. And this would make its way to the osteoblast and provoke uh, osteoblast to make lots of bone. So time is up. 
Uh, I'll stop here and hope that uh, taking you through a tour of some of the dense bone uh, diseases that cause either bad or importantly, good quality bone uh, has been of interest. Laura, back to you.